Uh, Justin's going to give a presentation on the interesting st stuff that he's been doing with Bro. Okay. So I was going to give a quick presentation on some projects that I have that work with Bro. Uh, so first project you may have heard of is very poorly named NetFlow Indexer. NetFlow Indexer is something I wrote a couple of years ago for doing quick searches on NetFlow data, and it also happens to work with con logs. So if you have, say, you know, 100 gigabytes of con logs and you often want to know, have I talked to this IP address, and you don't like waiting an hour to answer that question, NetFlow Indexer can help. The downside is that's pretty much all it does, but it does exactly that one thing, and it does it really well. So if you Google NetFlow Indexer, you'll come up with the website. It has documentation. I'll give you a quick demo of it. It has a little web interface that you can run. This is what it looks like. If I were to type in, say, let's make up an IP address that we've, I'm sure, never talked to. If I do, you know, 44, 55, 66, 77, I hit search. We'll take a second or two to read the indexes. And nothing. No one's ever talked to that address here in the past 11 months. If I type in something I know people have talked to, say, 1234, we get all the time someone's connected. And if you tell it to dump the records, It'll stream the con log to me. And that same kind of thing, because not everyone likes web interfaces, will work from, say, a command line interface like that. So dumping the records takes a little longer. But generally, for things like incident response, you don't mind waiting for positive results. People just hate waiting for negative results. If, if you know, some bulletin comes out that traffic to, say, you know, 77, 88, 99, 12 is horrible. And, Anyone talking to this IP address is completely compromised. You just want to do something like this, give it a couple of seconds, and have it come back and tell you that you're OK. And we're OK. No one's ever connected to that in it's about a year's worth of con logs at this point. Um, it has a, the REST API in the web interface. So we actually have, we run a Qbot here. It's a little IRC bot. So I have it hooked up so I can say, you know, do we have any traffic to 1234? And it'll just respond right in the IRC channel. Hey, you have traffic to that. If I change the IP address, no, no traffic to it. So that's Netflow Indexer. That's about all it does. If you need this exact thing, it's very useful. <laughs> if you need more complicated things, there's Splunk or Vast. Vast will work and do amazing things. Yes, but for now, this will do this one very specific thing really well and not take much resources at all. Uh, that's that. Um, any questions on NetFlow Indexer before I jump on to something else? What's the back end? What was that? What's the back end on this? Uh, it uses, oh, sorry. Uh, yes, what's the back end for it? It uses Zapian and the Python bindings for Zapian. So Python really just kind of handles the parsing of the con logs. Zapian does all the heavy lifting. So it's fairly efficient on how it works. So you see that there's connected to that address. You can pull up more velocity on what address is Yeah, just not on the IRC thing. But that was, so if I use, and all that script does is the little curl command. It's nothing complicated. If I run that, it'll do the dumping. And what that does is it uses the index result to know which log files to search, which will take a little longer. but. You only ever wait if there are results. If there's no results, you know, if I change that, you don't have to wait. It'll return pretty quickly. So, Oop. can you many uh, like gigabytes is the data oh. or how many connections per day? Give me a minute. Let's look. Uh, that would be here, and I believe the index goes back to September 1st, 2013. So the index size is 13 gigabytes. And the what was that? The no, the, the Zappian index for the searching is 13 gigabytes. For the logs, oh, this will be a pain, 9, 10, 11, 12, on that star, 2014, star, star, con. Star. Do I don't think I get that right? Let's see. No, not even close. What did I do? Oh, because it's the day is in there. 
there's another directory. OK. So the raw con logs are 729 gigabytes, if I did that right. So yeah, the indexes only store the unique IPs ever seen, because that's what you want. You want to know, did we ever see this IP? So it doesn't store the ports. It doesn't store the times. It stores what IPs have seen. So if you have about a terabyte of logs, you'll, depending on how many unique IPs have seen on your network, um, you're looking into a couple of percent. There's, on the website, I did a survey a while ago, and that's based on the people running it. That's how big their data was. So depending on, I guess, if you're, if you have end users on your network versus mostly like supercomputer type stuff, you'll have different index sizes. Um, so, anything else? All right, on to something else. I like my random presentation. Uh, so one of the things I've been working on, it's on GitHub, I believe. Or GitHub. Kind of on and off called, yes. So we have an app I've been working on that uses the Django REST framework to build a kind of crappy but usable interface inside of the admin site to manage bro tables. So as an example, we have some notices we want to ignore. So this is that table. And I'll show you how it comes together in a minute. So if I were to go here and type one, two, three, four, and type a actual message, and just do a testing for Brocon and save this. And then pop over on our actual bro box. Uh, do, 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 do. What is that table called? That table was called ignored notices. We have an ignored notices.csv. And you see it only has those first two items. And if I remember, there is a horrible thing, which you are hopefully not saving. I'll force the cron job to run, because I don't want to wait. And now if we look at that table again, it has our new line in it. So this is a way to centrally manage the bro tables without having to maintain the CSV files yourself. And other people in the groups can go and add items. Um, it's, it's kind of raw. I, I never built a nice interface to it. So as you can see, or that's a bit bigger. We don't want to look at that one. Um, you have the column types up here, and then it's just column 0, column 1, column 2, because I was lazy, and that was the easiest way to get it to work. But the neat thing is that it's all hooked up using the REST framework API. So there's actually a list. You can get a list of your tables. If you want that um, ignored notices, here's that data as a CSV, and you can download it. So it's all JSON API. It's all easy to work with. So still needs some work. I don't know how many of you are Python or Django programmers, but if you're looking for some way to try to manage bro tables a little more centrally with an interface and an API, uh, that's called Django bro tables, which you can, in theory, drop in a Django site and manage bro tables. So any questions on that? I have a feeling that's a little obscure, but that's all right. It's, it's just something I've been working on. Um, all right, those two things. Um, another thing that I have that could be interested more for like an incidence response point of view, but it can work with some of these tools, is a project I wrote a while ago called Ninfo, which does pluggable information gathering. So as a, another example, I put our favorite test IP address in here. And it's going to go and just do a ton of stuff for me. And as you can see, if I scroll all the way down, that's weird. All the way down to the bottom, you see one of them is that NetFlow indexer stats from right out of that daemon. Um, and one thing that it does, if you have Splunk, it can do some searches for some of the bro logs seen in Splunk. So this is interesting. I wasn't expecting this. What on earth is that? Oh, that's our, I have a. Thing I'll talk about next, which is passive DNS collection for Bro. So apparently, CrashClan does some license check that uses 1234 as the answer. 
which is very odd. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the point of info is you might have a lot of tools. You don't always want to use all the tools all the time because you have to log into each one separately. So with info, you write plugins. So you have you know, a Whois plugin, you have a GUIP plugin, and you just throw the IP in there. And it does lots of neat stuff. Like it'll support usernames too. So if I type my username, if it's nice, one of the plugins will do login records based on the Columbia Gulp idea, but ours uses Splunk. And it'll work the opposite way. So if I just go and grab this IP, wondering who it was, pop it into here, it's going to run all those plugins. Oh, apparently that's my address in Atlanta. So, and you can see I've done lots of talking from NetFlow. Actually, that might be the airport. I'm not sure. I don't know. But anyway, that's info. Lots of plugins. If you're having trouble making sense of lots of different APIs and lots of different data sources and doing things with prologs, potentially info can really help with that. And that's, um, you can find that on my GitHub account too. It's called info. And there's a nice presentation in docs. Uh, I don't have the PDF for it, but you can just read it there. Um, so the thing I came across over there, the passive DNS stuff. Has it, does anyone, oh, sorry, before I go on, does anyone have any questions on info? All right, okay. So I have two passive DNS projects. I have an kind of older one and a newer one I'm trying to get using Bro. Um, and it kind of works. It has some scaling issues if you have many, many, many tens of gigabits of DNS traffic, as some people do. It, it works well enough here, even using SQLite. It's, it's simple enough to get working. It's a couple of scripts that you load, and you need some Python packages installed. But what it does is it just builds a unique IP to DNS mapping database for all the DNS traffic that you see, and which can be very useful when you're trying to figure out what an IP is. So that's where you know you can, if I were to say, what IP address does Google give me here? You know, if I go and look this IP up, if it's going to be nice to me, there will be. No, it's not going to be nice to me. Oh, it's actually still running. All the plugins and info run asynchronously, so sometimes they take a while to run. But actually, it looks like that one didn't have any output. Oh, it's probably NCSA and IUC different Google addresses. I know it'll work because this should work. Oops. If I try Albany address, that should work. There we are. So if I put in an Albany address, it comes back and it knows and this actually one might work better if it has it. Potentially not. Okay, we'll go back to the other one. So often when you're trying to handle an incident, you might have connections to an IP address and you're trying to figure out what that host name was. Or if you're thinking about blocking an IP address, you might want to know, okay, we know this site runs on it that we want to block but are we accidentally going to block you know, 20 other sites that our users use because it's massively virtual hosted? You can put in an IP address and it'll get back just the unique source and destination pairs, um, which is a lot smaller than, say, trying to data mine your DNS logs. I believe I have it running here. Um, yeah, our DNS database after running for a couple of months is five gigabytes. I think our DNS logs per day are about five gigabytes. So it doesn't take mu uh, much resources, at least on the data side, to run a passive DNS database. You can see um, it's really a rather simple table. Oh, I need to, oh, one second, uh, do, 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 mode. I hate SQLite. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah, no, I wanted to show the column headers, but it never does it by default. And it's a stupid command. Oh, headers. Headers, there we are. Head. They really make this hard, don't they? Uh, one moment. Mode column. There we are. 
All right. So all it stores, and this will be truncated because SQLite is stupid, but it simply just stores the query, the answer that it got from that query, how many times it was seen, the first time it was seen, the last time it was seen, and whatever the last TTL was. So um, you can do some neat things, select like start from DNS, where count, find some, ah, yeah, so google.com resolved to this IP address many, many, many times, and all the web interface and the API does is queries like this. Oops, and that's the problem with SQLite. Don't use SQLite, use a real database, because <laughs> otherwise your database gets locked and things don't work. Ah, so there we are. So we can see all the different Google, and this will work better if I put that IP in here. What's, oh. the, what's the rationale behind the work you did? Are you afraid of rogue DNS servers or people packet injecting? Uh, no, it's mostly just to make, uh, sorry, the question was what's the rationale for collecting this data? It's, it's nothing that Bro isn't already collecting. It's just a much more compact representation because it's just storing the totals and the first and last seen. So mostly for incident response, or you know, basically you have this IP, you have some traffic to, you're trying to figure out, okay, I kind of have an idea what this IP address is. What else potentially runs on this IP address? Or it could be useful. I haven't implemented it for this, but there's this thing that you can do. You can do recursive passive DNS lookups. So is anyone familiar with the whole concept of like fast flux DNS where you have these command and control servers that run and it's a name that is constantly changing what IP address it resolves to. If you have really good passive DNS data, one thing you can do is put in an IP address and get out the list of names that it's used and then recursively do that with the names that you just got and get even more IP addresses and just keep doing this and you end up with this gigantic tree of you know, malicious IP addresses and host names. But primarily incident response and just having you know, a five gig database instead of 200 gigs of DNS logs. All right. Why are you doing the uh, DNS lookup? Well, no, no, it's all coming from the bro DNS logs. Okay, so when somebody hits Google, it's going to return one address, right? Oh, no, it, no, it. So it takes all the addresses for the A record? Yes, the DNS log logs multiple records. So, yes. Yeah, the theme of my little impromptu presentation is stuff that works with bro. So, <laughs> the, the original version of the passive DNS code I wrote use like TCP dump and some Python DNS modules. And I wanted to write kind of a simpler version that just leveraged the existing logs we already had with Bro, but still build a similar database on the back end. So that's that. Uh, any more questions about anything? I think Matias should give a vast presentation. Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Okay. I knew, I knew that was coming. All right. Um, I think that's about all I have, unless someone else reminds me of something I have that works with Bro that I'm forgetting about. I have, I have a lot of random projects, but I think that's it. Oh, I almost forgot. I have the, the Dumno thing. Who, who have I talked to about Dumno? Wow, that's a lot of people. I don't remember talking to that many people. Um, who has an Arista switch doing Tapag? Okay, okay, keep your hand up if you have things like grid FTP or like perf sonar that's slamming like 10 gigabit into your network. Okay, there's like two people and they're already using it, so that's not fun. Okay, what Dumno lets you do is inject ACLs into your Arista switch to filter flows until they disappear. So you can have Bro detect, say, a perf sonar connection or a grid FTP connection and tell the Arista to filter it so Bro does not have to see it anymore, which is very important when Perfsonar is dumping like nine gigabit into one of your boxes and overloading the NIC, and you just don't want to see it anymore. So it's really just this couple hundred line Python program. It's, yeah, 327 lines, manages the ACLs for you, and its companion project, which needs a bit of work, and I know I've Robin is, I think, working on something that's going to make this look like crap, is a reaction framework that lets you do things like shunt connections. So like the way I use it is 
there's this existing grid FTP data channel detected, I figure out which of the address is the local one to know if it's a you know origination or destination. And then I just call shunt. And then it's kind of crappy, but there's this exact, oops, Arista. I, I love the exec framework, so it uses exec to run this horrible command and sends a message over to the Arista. And I actually show you a quick demo of that, because it, it's running all the time here. So I don't know if anyone can read that, but depending on how long we have to wait here. Oh, I can trigger this, I think. Cos, cos, oh. One second here. Cosmos. I need a big file. And thankfully, they run a nice mirror here that has very, very, very big files. I need the CentOS one. They're not CentOS. Ubuntu. Uh, Ubuntu. Oh, I am going in the wrong place. Here? Where is it? I, oh, dirt. It's the one called CD images. So I will just, one moment, grab a nice big file here. No, and I believe this will work. Yep, there it goes. So it just shunted that connection. Oh, it, yeah, that's this one right here. So it realized right away, because I have that as a test site. So it added this rule to basically deny TCP host, this IP port 80, to this host, and that's the ephemeral port. And you see the connection finished, but basically about, actually this is time stamped, isn't it? So that was 3.11. This was the, so yeah, so pretty much you can see, here, better example. I will tell this in three seconds to start downloading that file. One, two, three, see, shunted. Oh, there it is. So as soon as it realizes it's gonna be bulk transfer, it chops it on the Arista switch and bro doesn't see it. So. So point out the real takeaway from the. Oh, yes, our stats. So. Sometimes, today it's been a little weird. Let me scroll up a little. I might find a better run here. Ah, yeah, see this is why, I don't know, can everyone read that part I have highlighted? The, the input and the output megabits going into the Arista. So, and this is probably perf sonar running. So at one point we had 12,000 gigabit going into the Arista and 1,800 leaving it, filtering a full 10 gigabit of data. So that's 10 gigabit of data that the bro cluster did not have to analyze. So, and that's, that's why we did this. And if I am lucky, I can actually show you graphs. Everyone loves graphs, yes. So we have our bandwidth there, and there's another one I can compare it to, which is here. The, the scale is the same, but the units are different, so don't try to read the numbers. But you can see, this is the, actually, look at by week here, by week. This is the uh, production cluster that's not behind the Arista, and this is the one that is behind the Arista. So you can see there is considerably less traffic at times from just filtering grid FTP and perf sonar. And I've been thinking about expanding. There's a couple of more applications that could be filtered that we're not yet filtering because um, it needs a little more work. But there's not much to it, and you can get some real gains by just filtering you know, two or three applications or a couple of different hosts. And the nice part is you're not just whitelisting the host. Because that would be pretty easy to do. You could put in a static ACL, but then if there was an incident, you would just be completely blind to the things that that host is doing. Especially when it's an application like Grid FTP that uses you know, 100 different ports. Really the only other option is just completely filter that host. So that's the before, that's the after. Way cheaper. Yeah. So the the point that I'm trying to goad Justin into to exposing is the difference between these two graphs. It's money. You can spend the money. So go to the, the left one. You can spend the money to analyze that traffic, and and NCSA has a production cluster that is not doing the shunting, right? And 
it's significantly more expensive. Granted, yes, you, you do see everything, but maybe it's okay not to see everything if it costs you 20% what it would cost you otherwise. Yeah, that might be a little Because if, if yeah. you have the ability to, to have to manage and monitor and buy 10 physical bot, if you have the, would you rather buy and manage 10 or two? NCSA is especially weird. They had these enormous drops in traffic, though. But um, uh, Ashish at LBL has been running this, too, and the drops there. Have, well, actually, Ashish, where are you? Is he in here? What, what was yours? Like, it, was, it was about 30% like, drop. Uh, their, their traffic is a little more mixed. It's still a lot of uh, high performance type stuff. So it's probably more than on just corporate networks. But um, it was still a 30% reduction in traffic just immediately from, from enabling this. Yep. And yeah, it's, it's like if you have to drop something, I mean, you're certainly going to want to drop this sort of really large stuff instead of like the bot check-in that was, you know, a 10K connection or something like that. Anyway, sorry, I, I just kept, I wanted to keep cutting that deeper and deeper that it's really a money thing at the, at yeah, the very I don't, bottom. I don't, what's money? Like, the, the boxes just show up one day. Like, I don't, I don't know. The, just, okay, fair. Yeah. The, so the other thing to mention is that the control packets that you didn't mention, Justin, was the control packets are still coming through after oh, post yeah. filtering on the Arista. So not only are, is all this traffic being dropped and not analyzed by Bro, but at the same time, the Bro logs are complete. We see the full transaction, the full uh, connection logged in Bro as if it actually occurred. So that's, it's magic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, the funny story goes is we spent uh, like an hour trying to debug uh, because we were seeing complete connection logs, so we thought uh, the shunting is not working. Yeah. yeah, you actually see, I, I realize if I dump the accessless status, we can see some connections that are currently being shunted, and this matches the number of packets. So this connection, you know, some SSH connection, that's how many packets that have been blocked from getting to Bro? What's that, 433 million? So one, one little ACL has prevented Bro from seeing 433 million packets. And it's an SSH connection, so there's nothing good that could have came from Bro seeing that in the first place. So. But in, and because of the, the connection tracking, you still get all the information that you would have anyway. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if you noticed at the top, but I pre-allow all fin, sin, and reset packets, and I'm only filtering half the flow. In theory, the side that's sending all the traffic. Half the connection. Yeah, ha half the connection, one flow. So if you were to look in con log, Bro still knows when the connection started, when the connection stopped, how many bytes were on the connection. It just thinks it missed a lot of the bytes, but it's not blind to this connection. So it's almost, yeah, re really everything works except, say, file extraction or the checksum of the flow or some kind of packet because you're not sending it to Bro. But it still knows that, yeah, this connection took. 12 hours and someone transmitted four terabytes. It still has all the bookkeeping on the back end. So. Does it really mess with the capture loss? Yes. Yeah. And I, I did mention that to Robin, and that's hopefully one thing we'll figure out how to address. Bro does have a function called skip further processing, where if you did just want Bro to just forget about this connection, you could call that but then you wouldn't get how long the connection was, how many bytes it was. I guess what we need is kind of an in-between, a kind of like ignore missing bytes because I am dropping half of this connection function. And then, and then things would be OK. And that's, because essentially we're, you know, we're, we are dropping packets. So bro is correctly, or cor whatever. Yeah, correctly detecting that things are missing. They are missing, it's just missing on purpose. It just doesn't know that. So we'll just need to figure out a way to tell it, like, hey, you're about to miss large chunks of this connection, but don't worry, it's on purpose. So, all right. Oh, yes. So this is a capability which, as Justin was hinting at, we want to get into Bro proper, basically in a, in a in form of a framework which is also um, independent of the actual hardware you're using. So this is for Arista. 
Um, but if you have some other hardware and using, um, I don't know, it could be OpenFlow, it could be some other vendor proprietary protocol, um, you want to have some kind of plugin infrastructure so that a script can kind of trigger this kind of functionality. Um, and then you provide a plugin for the specific hardware you have in your network, and it will kind of branch out to that and, and, and do whatever is necessary to get that into place. And that also plays into the SDN angle we heard about this morning, um, which in some sense is very similar. So, so you might have different capabilities in your network to enforce certain things, and um, we would like to provide an API inside Bro um, to, to take these actions without you having to worry actually about what the hardware can do or how it does it specifically. So that's something on the on the roadmap for yeah. upcoming versions. The, the, the code I put together, I tried to keep in mind that it would probably be expanded, but it's really the simplest thing that could possibly work. It doesn't try to do every possible thing in the world. It was just, we got this test switch, I need to get this working, what's the simplest thing that could possibly work? And that's this. So I'm sure there'll be much more advanced tools like this in the future. I mean, this, sh this shows how cool it is. Actually, yeah. this is I mean, as really a proof kind of, of concept, the, 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 the capability. I mean, there's no denying that e even in like proof of concept mode, this works, especially yeah. for like science-y traffic that we have. It saves a lot of effort on the bro side. Well, it's, it's the same scale, there are different units. Because I'm not so good at Munion, and one, one ended up in bits per second, and one ended up in bytes per second. But this is 2.5 2 gigabytes, this is 20 gigabit, so that's the same scale, or should be about the same scale. So, yeah. I tried to fix it, I gave up. So, all right, I think that's about all I have for now. Um, if anyone wants to help me on any of these projects, just let me know. Or try to get them running and let me know when they break, because they'll break. Um, all right. Thanks.